In this video, we're going to look at breathing mechanisms of humans. Then we're going to look at insects, frogs, as well as fish. Let's get right to it. First, we need to understand what breathing means. Breathing is basically the repeated action of inhalation, breathing in, and exhalation, breathing out. This is breathing. So what are the mechanisms of breathing? First, let's look at humans. In humans, since we are all familiar with how we breathe, let's look at humans first. The breathing mechanism in general follows a very basic principle. If we want air to enter a space, a confined space, then we need to reduce the air pressure in the said space. And how do we reduce this pressure? One of the ways, which is the ways that we use in breathing mechanisms, is to expand the volume of the space. So when we expand the volume of the space, then the pressure in the space drops. And this is where air from the outside will be forced in. This is the basic principle of inhalation. Let's look at how that is done in humans. So in humans, there are three main things that are involved. That is this, all these things that you see here, this together make up the rib cage. And then the muscle that is controlling the rib cage, this one right underneath it in this picture, but actually it's attached to it. This is the intercostal muscle. Intercostal muscles, there are two sets. That is the internal intercostal muscle, which is on the inner layer, and the external intercostal muscle, which is on the outer layer. So there are two sets of muscles here. We'll look more at that later. And then we also have another piece of muscle here at the floor of this space. This space is known as the thoracic cavity, the chest cavity. The floor of it is known as, there's a piece of muscle here that's known as the diaphragm. And so these are the main things that are going to be controlling the volume of the thoracic cavity, which is the respiratory cavity. And therefore, by controlling the volume, it controls the pressure of the thoracic cavity. And so when we want the space to become bigger during inhalation, once again, we want the pressure to drop, which means we want a bigger space. When you want a bigger space, what needs to happen is the rib cage needs to be pulled upwards and outwards. So that when we breathe in, we can see our chest comes up and out. So that's what's going to happen here. And who does this? Who pulls the rib cage? It's the intercostal muscles. So the first thing that happens here when we are inhaling, number one, the external intercostal muscles contract. Intercostal muscles come in two sets, one pair. The external and internal muscles, this is an antagonistic pair of muscles, meaning when mus one muscle contracts, the other relaxes. If this one contracts, this one relaxes. And so when the external intercostal muscle contracts, pulls the cage up and out, at the same time, the internal intercostal muscles must relax. The net effect is that the rib cage is pulled upwards and outwards. So now we've expanded the space. And besides that, remember we also have the diaphragm muscle. So what the diaphragm muscle does is, it actually contracts. So it moves down and it flattens. The diaphragm flattens, it becomes flat. So the net effect of all this, the overall effect is that the entire volume of the thoracic cavity is increased. And when the volume of the space increases, the air pressure in the thoracic cavity will decrease. And now relative to the atmosphere, the, the pressure inside the thoracic cavity is lower. So what happens spontaneously is air, the higher atmospheric pressure will force air into the lungs and we are said to have inhaled air. So this is the process of inhalation. What about the process of exhalation? Again, the thing that we control is the space of our respiratory cavity, the chest cavity. So the basic principle here is that when you want to exhale, when you want to expel air outwards, the pressure in the cavity must be higher than the atmosphere. 
So we are trying to increase the pressure of air in the chest cavity. And how do we do that? By reducing the volume, by making it smaller. You are squeezing the space so that the pressure increases and air is forced out. Now, how does this happen? With the same three things again. So this time, we don't want, when we breathe out, what's happening is the rib cage is going to move downwards and inwards instead. And for this to happen, the external intercostal muscles are not going to contract this time. It's the internal intercostal muscles that are going to contract. And therefore, the external intercostal muscles are going to relax. And then what happens is the rib cage moves downwards and inwards. So the rib cage goes in, down and in. That's why when we breathe out, you can see our shoulders start to go down and we start to slouch. We are going in. We are, we are squeezing the space here. And then what happens to the diaphragm? You can see the diaphragm actually relaxes and forms this shape. Now, this is a 2D structure. In actuality, it is like this. It forms this shape and this is the dome shape. So the diaphragm muscle relaxes, move upwards and forms a dome shape. And the overall effect of all this is that the volume decreases and the pressure of the thoracic cavity increases and therefore the higher pressure in the thoracic cavity now will force air out of the lungs. And that is exhalation. So this is inhalation and exhalation in humans. Let's go to insects. Insects are pretty simple. They don't have complex structures. So what is involved in the inhalation of insects? The basic principle is still the same. Control the volume and then you control the pressure and then air will move spontaneously. So what happens here is the abdominal muscles of the insects relax. Yes, insects do have muscles. The abdominal muscle of the insect relaxes. This will cause the space to expand and the pressure will drop because the space has increased. You can try it yourselves. When you tighten your abdominal muscles, tighten your abs, you will notice that it goes inwards. Whereas when you just relax, then you can see it comes outwards. And so that's the same case. And then what happens is air enters through the spiracles. And then for exhalation in insects, what happens is the abdominal muscle then contracts. This will tighten the space, reduce the space, reduce the volume, pressure will increase, pressure in the trachea will increase and air will be forced out through the spiracles. That's it for insects. Now let's look at frogs. Frogs are a little bit more complicated. So when we look at the frog, first of all, there is the nostril of the frog, here, the nostril, and then the frog has this space, this is the, the mouth and the throat. So it's called the bacopharyngeal. Baco for mouth, pharyngeal for throat. Bacopharyngeal cavity. And then there is a flap here that controls the opening in between the two spaces. This is the glottis. And then just beyond the glottis is the second space, which is, this is finally, the lungs. So these are the structures involved in the breathing mechanism of the frog. Now, the principle once again is the same. During inhalation, what must happen is the pressure in the space where we want air to enter must be low. And how do we control the pressure? By controlling the volume of the space. So when we want to inhale, we need to increase the volume to drop the pressure relative to the surrounding. And so during inhalation, there are two steps. First of all, the first step involves air entering into this space, just the buccopharyngeal cavity. That's the first step. So let's focus on that first. So at this point, the mouth is closed and the glottis is closed. The first point of inhalation, mouth and glottis are closed. And then what happens is, how does the frog control the volume of the buccopharyngeal cavity? This is done through the floor of the buccopharyngeal cavity. 
when we all imagine frogs, we always imagine the frog breathing with this part, this whole part coming out and going in, coming out and going in. So that part that comes out and goes in is the floor of the buccopharyngeal cavity. This space here, this one at the bottom here. So during inhalation, what will happen is this will be lowered so as to increase the volume in the buccopharyngeal cavity. So that's exactly what happens. It is lowered and the moment that it is lowered, then the pressure is going to drop. The volume increases and the pressure drops. So when the pressure drops, what happens is air will then be forced in once again. This is a spontaneous process. Air is forced in through the nostrils. And now air has entered the first cavity, the first cavity, which is the buccopharyngeal cavity. But this is not where gaseous exchange occurs. Gaseous exchange has to occur in the lungs. So now what's going to happen is, the next stage is, the glottis has to open. And this time, the nostrils have to be closed. Because we don't want air to go out through the nostrils. We want air to go from the buccopharyngeal cavity into the lungs. And how do we force that the air into the lungs? How does the frog force the air into the lungs? The buccopharyngeal cavity floor is once again raised. So it's squeezing the air, opening the glottis, only one place for air to go, air enters the lungs. That's exactly what happens here. And so the glottis is open but the mouth and nostrils are closed because we don't want air to go anywhere else. And then the floor is raised again, the floor of the buccopharyngeal cavity, air is forced into the lungs. So this is inhalation. Exhalation happens when, because the lungs are elastic, when it expands during inhalation, it has a tendency to return to its original shape. That's the elastic property of the lungs. So that lungs will tend to return to the original shape. At this time, what will happen is the glottis will remain open and then the nostrils will open. And so what will happen is air will be forced into the buccopharyngeal cavity. Some of the air will escape out through the nostrils. The exhalation process is a bit simpler. Now, this is also helped by, you will notice that there is no a special structure like in humans, we have the intercostal muscles and the ribcage to help control the volume, but the frog doesn't have that. The frog does have abdominal muscles to help. So this process is aided by the abdominal muscles. So what happens in exhalation? First, the lungs contract. So the lungs contract and air is forced out. And this is helped by the abdominal pressure and the elasticity of the lungs, as I explained earlier. And then what happens is some air is expelled through the nostrils, but the rest is mixed with the air in the buccopharyngeal cavity. So this is the breathing mechanism of frogs. Now let's go to fish. What about fish? So fish, this by the way, is us looking up down at a fish. So imagine a fish is like this, right? This is a fish. We are looking from the top. We are looking here. So you're looking like this, like this. So we can see this is the mouth of the fish. Just inside the mouth we have a space and this is the mouth. So this is the buccal cavity. And then just behind the buccal cavity we have another space. We have another two spaces. Actually it's a continuous space. So this space here is called the opercular cavity. Why is it called the opercular cavity? Because this thing here, the cover of the gills, the gill cover so to speak, is known as the operculum. Alright, so when we think about fish swimming in the water, we know that there's the side part of the fish that comes up and goes in, comes out and goes in like this. So this so-called flap that is moving is the operculum. So the space just underneath, when you open the space, you will see that the gills are there. There will be the red, the red structure there, which is the gills. So, so what happens is this operculum actually, actually is just outside of the gills. 
Alright, so what happens with the fish? Of course, the fish is not going to breathe in air. The fish is going to allow water to go in. But in the fish, the story is a bit different. The water goes into the mouth. The water does not come out of the mouth. Instead, once the water goes into the mouth, it comes out through the operculum here, behind here. So water goes in to the mouth and it comes out here at the sides. So that's how it happens with the fish. Now let's look at this in more detail. So the inhalation process of the fish, the concept is still the same. Instead of air pressure, now we have water pressure. During inhalation, what do we want to do? We want to reduce the pressure inside. So what to do? Increase the volume. So how do you increase the volume? How does the fish increase the volume? First of all, the floor, the mouth of the fish, the buccal cavity floor is lowered. So the first thing is that the mouth is open and the opercular opening is closed. So the mouth is going to open to allow water in. The opercular opening is this little black thing you see here. This little flap controls whether it's open or closed. So this is closed because now we want water to come in. We want the space to expand and the pressure to drop. If the opercular opening is open, then the pressure will equalize with the surrounding and there's no point to this. So it has to remain closed. Only the mouth must be open. And so what happens is the floor of the buccal cavity is lower to increase the volume. The opercular cavity is enlarged as well. So the opercular cavity is enlarged by the movement of the outward movement of the operculum. The operculum moves outwards. And so then what happens is the water pressure in the buccal cavity is reduced. Then water is forced in. Water with dissolved oxygen is forced into the mouth. And then during the exhalation process, the mouth closes and now the opercular opening opens. The opercular opening opens up because now we want water to flow out to the operculum opening. So why is that the case? Because if you look at this, these are the gills. This is a gill arch. This is a gill arch. And these are the gills. And this is where the gaseous exchange occurs. So we want water to flow through the gills, through the filaments and the lamellae, and we want it to go out. And so in order for this to happen, first, the mouth space is made smaller. So the mouth is closed and the floor of the buccal cavity is raised. Right? So first, let's talk about the orifices. So the mouth is closed, opercular opening is open. Then the buccal cavity floor is raised. So this forces all the water in the buccal cavity backwards into the opercular cavity. So it goes into the opercular cavity and it flows through the lamellae. That's what happened here. Water passes through the gill lamella. Gaseous exchange occurs, of course. This is where the exchange occurs between the water and the blood of the fish. And then the opercular muscle relaxes and the opercular cavity becomes smaller. So earlier during inhalation, the opercular muscle contract to enlarge the opercular cavity space. But now it's going to relax and it's going to come back down. It's going to relax and come downwards like this. So it's going to push in. So what happens is this space becomes smaller and therefore the pressure increases and water is forced out. Water is forced out through the opercular opening. So the volume is reduced, pressure increases, water flows through the opercular opening. So water comes into the mouth, comes out through the opercular opening. That is the breathing mechanism of the fish. I hope you guys liked the video. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Please do me a favor and hit the like button if you did learn something. And if you think this video is helpful, do share it with your friends. If you'd like to, I'd appreciate a super like as well. Thank you very much, guys. I hope to see you guys in the next video.